Uh, our next speaker is uh, Kyla McClellan. She's at the University of Michigan, and her interests are really in kind of educational software development. And so she's going to be talking to us on Green, designing educational software for relationship learning uh, and eclectic uh, arrangement. All right, good morning, everybody. So as you said, I'm here to talk about DREAM. And I know this is an extremely long title, and I'll get into all of this later. <laughs> so what's the reason for my research? First of all, I want to identify which two broad classes of emotional design, in, like in emotional design elements, visceral and behavioral. And by visceral, I mean um, the site of software, what it sounds like, the first impression you have, and then behavioral, which is the way the software functions. So I want to determine which of these two aspects they yield the, great, the greatest learning improvement in children. And also, I'd like to qualify the utility of these, and when these, of these elements when they're included in child-centered design interfaces. So first I'll talk about, um, I'll give you a little background, I'll talk about my method, I'll give you some results, and I'll conclude. But I'd like to add that um, this is a work in progress. So why are we even concerned with this? First of all, children are very different than adults. Children have different learning, um, different attention spans, they have different motor skills than adults, and they have different literacy levels. So we need to study exactly how to design software so that it can benefit children. Um, because most of the research that's on um, interface design focuses on interface design for adults. And Tom Malone was actually a, a pioneer of designing interfaces for children and he analyzed children's use of games and he designed also like a set of guidelines or rules to use when designing interfaces for children. And um, some of my work borrows from um, the design guidelines that he set. So um, very quickly I'm going to go through a framework of designing um, interfaces. Don't worry, I'll expect you to be able to read the stuff at the bottom. Um, <laughs> I looked at a lot of interface design um, criteria for, soft, for educational software for children, and I felt that they all fell into one of four categories. So I grouped them into these. The first is an emotionally appealing interface, and I'll just point out a few things on here, such as personal messages that address the user, um, rounded symmetrical objects, harmonious sounds. This is all, all of these are sort of visceral things. Um, rhythmic beats, smiling faces, bright, saturated hues. And also, um, emotionally appealing fantasies. Um, the user should be able to explore the environment for themselves. Um, there should be a clear goal. Um, there should be, the main character should be controlled by the child. Um, these are a few things. The interaction, there should be a lot of um, interaction options for the child. There should be audio and visual effects. Um, the messages should use everyday English. These are just a few of the, um, the features that are important. And there should be a degree of uncertainty because if the game, if the child knows exactly what's going to happen every single time they play, they become disinterested and disengaged, and that's not what we want to happen. So there's also an element of uncertainty. And after I combine this whole framework, you can see that emotion appears as a design necessity in many of these four categories. So um, emotion, generally speaking, it's a very internal and individual phenomenon, but there's a lot of challenges that we face when we try to talk about emotion in a research setting. Number one, emotion, emotion is very hard to define. It's internal, it's individual, it's hard to quantify. And it's also subjective because a situation in which I feel sad, someone may observe me and say, oh, she's not sad, but it's very subjective. So we wanted to, um, that's, a, that's a challenge that we have. <laughs> So um, there's also research that shows that a person's emotional state interacts with their cognitive abilities. And um, if you're in a state of positive emotion, generally you, um, you're able to learn better, you can solve problems better, make better decisions, and all sorts of things that we like for the user so that they can perform well. But if you're in a state of negative emotion, as you can imagine, then um, obviously you get distracted, um, it narrows your attention span, and it can hinder systematic processing, and that's not something that we want when the um, child is playing the software. <clears throat> so, the way that we incorporated some of these emotional design elements into the software is on the visceral level, um, I included bright colors, 
um, soothing sounds, they're very rhythmic beats. Um, I developed a piece of software, which I'll show you in a second. Um, they're smiling faces, all of the, um, as you can see, these are all of the, a lot of the same elements that I refer to in the chart. And on the behavioral level, I included personal messages, feedback, um, there's hints whenever, whenever the child um, seems to have gotten off the beaten path. Um, there's, the instructions are readily deducible. There were no written instructions on the, um, in the entire game, just to alleviate that pressure of knowing, we had to be able to know how to read. And there's also tools to let the user explore. So, my, for my experiment, I used four to six year old children who were in an after school program that um, dealt mostly with social, children who had social and economic hardship problems. Um, there were about 19 students, and they played both the visceral and the behavioral, um, the visceral and behavioral visceral components, and I'll go into what that means in a second. Um, the content of the game was relationship learning, and relationship learning typically deals with the relationships between objects, and this is pretty much the way that children learn how to categorize, because as a lot of you know, in standardized testing, um, there are a lot of analogies and questions that make use of our knowledge of categorization. And a lot of school systems get their fundings from these standardized testing. And if the children don't know how to categorize and don't know how to perform these actions, then in turn, the schools will perform, they won't perform as well, and then in turn, not receive as much funding. So it's like a vicious cycle. And there's also research by Weich that says that children in low, so, you know, low socioeconomic um, environments, they struggle with this skill. So you can see why um, we'd like to design software to address this problem. And there were three versions of the game created. Um, first is visceral and behavioral, where it had all of the visceral design elements and all of the behavioral design elements. Um, there's one that was just behavioral, so as you can see, it's in black and white. They all look the same here. I couldn't demo the um, game because of time restraints, but um, it's in black and white, and all of the behavioral elements are, um, are a feature. And then there's just visceral, where it's just the sight, the sound, the feel, and the, um, and the auditory things, but there's no like instructions and things like that. So we want to really you know, tease apart the parts of the software and the interface to see what exactly contributes to the child learning. So um, this is the first map of the game. It's called Mellow's World, and in Mellow's World, he gets to pick what adventure he wants to pursue. Um, and the game, and the version of the game that we tested, we tested Mellow's Home, where, as you'll see in, okay, maybe it's on two more slides, but <laughs> in, um, in the Mellow's Home version, um, well, so I'll just talk about the experimental procedure first, and then I'll tell you what happens in the actual game. So we use a between subjects design, and we gave the children a fixed play time of two trials for um, playing the game. So they went to the home level twice. And we did this because there's research that shows that you know, children have a hard time focusing for a long period of time. So we wanted to keep it very short so that we wouldn't get negative feedback that they were um, disinterested. For, so for the procedure, first there was a flashcard pretest. And in the flashcard pretest, um, we, there were various items, all of which were either um, clothing or they were toys, and we had the children group them into groups that go together just to see what sort of category structure they had initially. And we took notes of you know, their groupings that they made, and then um, we had them play the game, Mellow's World, in which um, the child is instructed to clean up a room which has obviously toys and clothing in it, and there's a hamper and a toy box and we observe them playing the game and how many trials it takes for them to correctly classify all of the items, the amount of time that it takes. And then after they play the game, we do the flashcard task again to see if the groupings that they've made, if they've changed. And then afterwards, we conducted a semi-structured interview just to understand exactly what the child thought of the game and you know things that we could improve. And we use flashcard tasks because um, we just so learning is defined as a change in performance, and if the performance initially with the flashcard test changes from the performance at the end, then we can measure that as learning. Um, they all worked independently. We collected their impressions, and we used video cameras because since 
the children that we use are four to six years old, they're not very reflective at that age, so it's hard to ascertain exactly um, how the game made them feel. And we tried to ask questions, but we didn't expect much there. But you know, there, there was some hit and miss. So we used video cameras as well to capture some things. So in the pilot study, as I said before, we had 19 children, and they were four to six years old with the mean age being 5.6 years, and they played the visceral and behavioral visceral versions. Um, and we wanted to first evaluate the methodology and see if there were any ceiling effects, because, for example, um, from them playing the game and then um, doing the flashcard test, they could all perform extremely well, and that would be a ceiling effect, because we couldn't, uh, we couldn't observe how much they um, learn because if everyone performed high, then there would be no data. And we also wanted to judge the appropriateness. So what we saw, um, so first from the flashcard task, um, the way that we measured the groupings was we used some, a concept called edit distance, meaning from the groupings that they made, we measured how many card manipulations it would take to form the correct structure with all of the um, clothing items in one category and all of the uh, toys in another category. And from what you can see here, um, from the pretest, it seems like everyone needed about 2.5 um, manipulations to go into the correct category. But from the in the visceral version, in the post test, for some reason, they only needed 1.72. So we're still collecting data as we speak. So this is something we'll still be looking at. And in the gameplay, we also recorded the number of trials that it took each child to correctly classify all of the items in the room. And these numbers are looking very similar, so we're going to have to um, do more data analysis and maybe look at more factors to see what's going on there. So we also conducted a, like I said, a semi-structured interview. And um, I, from what Kiki said in her talk, she asked, you know, who collects end-user uh, and user analyses, and it's very hard to do that in our line of works. People typically don't because children are very, I don't know, they're kind of fickle sometimes, so it's hard to see exactly what in the world they're trying to get at. So a lot of them said, you know, um, we tried to look at the comments and the number of comments and the types and like what levels they pertain to, if it was a visceral thing or if it was a behavioral thing, and sometimes it was nothing. Like, um, I like the coloring part, the game, sometimes the game talk too much, I wish there were more levels, I like putting the things away. So, from here it seems like they commented a lot on the behavioral design elements, but this is still something that we need to look more into the literature and learn how to code for children's um, responses. So this is something else that I'm also looking at. Um, there are also some signs of positive um, emotional states in the video that um, I wasn't able to code, like some children like nodded their heads to the music or tapped their feet or they're like, oh, I like this, or you know, they would go, ooh, or something like that. So we have to figure out exactly how to quantify those things. <laughs> and there's like, so we have to figure out how to code all of these things and the things that they say, the random things that could happen while they're playing the game. <clears throat> There were some ceiling effects. 26% of the participants did perform, you know, exactly as they should have afterwards. It's not everyone, so we still need to, as I said, gather more data to see if this is a trend. Um, it was age appropriate. They all understood the game. Um, there was a challenge with the open-ended questions, as I mentioned before, and um, all of this hits to a uh, rank ordering. It seems as though. Um, from the other slide that the visceral, um, the visceral version of the game seems to produce uh, more learning than the other, design, than the other uh, version of the game. And my contribution, I intend to, my academic contribution is just to make a ranking for um, emotional design games so that you can, say if you had a game and you didn't have a lot of money or time, you could say, okay, well I know what I should include in order for children to learn. So there's a ranking of these things so that if you're in this type of constrained environment, you know what to include. And also, um, practically, a lot of school systems don't have a lot of money for expensive, flashy games. So um, it's a very, this is a very simple, it's, it's, also, it's called Flash, but it's not very flashy, but um, <laughs> they can make simple Flash games that aren't very expensive for their children to still learn with. And in the future, I want to increase the number of participants, test the other version of the game, and implement more levels. These are my acknowledgments, and now I'll take questions.
question to this one over in the back? Um, you talked about the flashcard pre-test, mm -hmm. and was it more diagrams or words on the flashcards? The flashcards were pictures of real-life representations of the things on the floor of the room. I thought I had a screenshot of the actual gameplay, but um, there's like a, there's a bed and a teddy bear standing on it. There's a bunch of stuff on the floor, and the child has to drag things around in the room that's like blocks, crayons, jeans, random things. So it's just like real-world representations of all of those things. We're still looking into the research because I'm a computer scientist and I didn't do any sort of behavioral experimental background, so this is something I'm still looking into the literature for. I'm sure that the psychology literature and the child development literature has something. Yeah, it's a lot of stuff with facial. We have a question from um, It took about a summer, and that was because I had I had not used Flash before, and I was unfamiliar with it. But to implement the new levels, I'd imagine it would take three weeks to do the levels, just because I've learned, you know, how to do everything the first time I made the game. Thanks, Tyler. We, we're going to, you know, all of these people will be here uh, after in the break, so we'll have a chance to kind of ask some questions individually.